afternoon from Castle Goring, from Mickey, Aurora, and from me. I'm going to plunge right in because we have a lot of ground to cover and not that much time in which to cover it. So without further ado, if Aurora will allow me, E. Land says, I saw pictures of Harry post-Jubilee at the polo game. Is he trying to be a sexy model for Netflix? Is Netflix pushing Harry in a new direction? Or does Harry think he really is such a momentous object of desire that posing the way he did will attract more viewers to his reality show? Don't do that, Aurora. <laughs> you can't chew my clothes. Go on, <laughs> move. <laughs> Good girl. <laughs> the joys of puppies. <laughs> well, the truth is Harry has always had a very high opinion of himself and has always thought that he was a gift to womanhood. So that is actually capturing his spirit, let's put it that way. He also needs content and he needs glamour and that is why they are doing the polo because polo is one of with racing the sport of the kings so it's for netflix content it's for glamour i'm not so sure how interesting people are going to find harry and megan and their antics except if it's going to be <laughs> sort of oh how shall we put it oh a great send-up but as the glamorous royals the young royals despite being middle-aged who fled from the restrictions of royalty to find freedom and pots of gold at the end of the corporate table in America. How well is that going to play? I'm not so sure it's going to play very well, quite frankly. I could be wrong. But they have now been unmasked as being extraneous and that they don't really have the prestige that they would have liked people to believe that they possessed and that people naively believed they possessed in the first and second instance. Quintessence says there's something that I haven't heard anyone discuss and it is as follows. Harry and Meghan being present in person at the Jubilee was the ultimate proof that the terrible lies that they told have been completely disregarded by the entire world. The Queen and the royal family remain beloved by most, and they are seen as total losers in every sense of the word. Talk about a slap in the face. Quintessence. I would say that you are all right up to a point. I would say you're mostly right, but I wouldn't say that they have been completely disregarded by the entire world. They have their supporters, evidently far fewer than would appear to be the case, because evidently our uh, they have an awful lot of paid supporters. I think it's called bots that are supporting them. And But Megan would know all about that because, of course, I think that's something that she would have a technique. She would have been able to learn while doing the TIG and adopt to enhance her profile. Megs Bufton says, Lady C, 
one must ask why would Harry, who says he wants to live a private life and just wants to be known as just Harry, be upset for getting exactly what he claimed he wanted. Exactly is in big block capitals as was why. His grandmother obliged him and with his decisions in perspective, he and his wife were assigned seats that befit their station. Is that not correct? Isn't this exactly big block capitals? What they both said on many capital M-A-N-Y and capital B-O-T-H occasions that they both capitals wanted. Yes, well, you know, we have this phenomenon of answered prayers. They said it. Did they really mean it? No, they wanted to be in and out. They wanted to eat their cake and have it. They wanted to have all the prestige and the privileges of being royal and to hawk their wares on the street corner like the cheap hustlers that they have enacted themselves as being maybe expensively cheap, but cheap nevertheless. They never wanted to be downgraded. They wanted everything. Harry is extremely, extremely full of himself and his own importance and has always been, always. Megan, she, it all went to her head. She couldn't believe that she had lived and gone to heaven. And it went to her head and she has a massive head. I don't know if you've noticed it, but she has a massive head. I have to say, fortunately, she was born by Caesarean section. Otherwise, I don't think that her mother could have coped because she has one of the largest heads it is possible for a human being to have. Look at it. It is twice the size it should be in profile. And it is full of herself. And it has swollen to an exponential and actually a sick extent because both Harry and Meghan are really very, in my opinion, going off their conduct. Very sick individuals who have no concept of their own importance, no humility, no insight into what it is to be truly human. Oh yes, they're full of themselves, but those selves have been revealed to be puffed up. Cat S says, Lady C, I saw a repeat video of H&M walking down the aisle to their assigned seats at St. Paul's Cathedral. I noticed that there were many snickers as they walked past. The disdain was obvious on the faces of many of the attendees at that church. Very well observed. I can tell you something. I've seen it in action. I've actually executed it myself. But I remember when Diana, Princess of Wales, had every single establishment door, with very few exceptions, slammed in her face. It was not a pretty sight. There are ways of cold-shouldering people, looking through them. You don't cut them. You just act as if they don't exist. 
I think we saw Peter Phillips and <laughs> Mike Tyndall do it very effectively at uh, the church service. You remember on the steps at the end. Uh, what did Harry and Meghan expect? Had they left nicely or even bitterly, but not made a song and dance about it and washed their dirty linen in public? Had they not lied about the reception that she had been given by the British people? Had they not puffed themselves up with the nonsense about Does that woman think she is? I mean, does she think she owns the word royal? I mean, I am a proud, confident woman of colour. And I was a star of suits. She's just the Queen of England. Who does she think she is? I mean, she really just doesn't know her place. I mean, what on earth is this woman on about? I mean, who are these people? I mean, don't they recognize greatness when they see it? Obviously not, they're too dumb. Then to go on Oprah and tell lie after lie after lie, and then to make not only accusations, but constantly pushing themselves forward in the most inappropriate way, declaring that they are more important than they are, and that people should buy that lie. People see through it. No, you know, most people have a very low tolerance for BS. They might tolerate it in small doses and be polite. But when they're bombarded with it to the extent that Harry and Meghan and their PR people bombard the world, I mean, you're either going to get buried in a sea of feces or then you're going to say, no, no, this is utter rubbish. No. It's BS. And once people see that the emperor has on no clothes, and worse, the emperor's naked body isn't worth seeing. And the emperor thinks he's a big, butch, handsome guy, when in fact he's a pot-bellied winkle picker. Once you are exposed as lacking, it's very difficult to regain the admiration that people like that seek. And Harry and Meghan are all about admiration, adoration, adulation, attention. Angela says, if the seat was good enough for the daughter of Princess Margaret, it is surely good enough for the daughter of Doria. Yeah, well, I mean, who is Lady Sarah Chatto? I mean, she's just a granddaughter of a king and a queen. Meghan is a proud, confident woman of colour who was a star in suits. I mean, that trumps anything that, I mean, daughter, granddaughter of a king and queen, daughter of a princess, I mean, you know, <laughs> and Meghan's all by her own account given birth to two royal babies, one a prince that he's been deprived of the title and the other a princess and she's been deprived of the title of princess. Well, I mean, that surely trumps Princess Margaret. Gotta trump Princess Margaret. Or am I missing something? I think I might be missing something, don't you? <laughs> 
Sean at Old McLeod says, they had to sit in the seats allocated to them because Johnny Thompson, one of the Queen's guards, was seated right behind them and was assigned to keep an eye on them for their own safety, of course. That was the correct decision as it turned out. Well, you know, Meghan and Harry have made a big song and dance about the fact that they don't feel secure. So what could have been more compassionate and thoughtful than seating them not in the front row where they would have been easy targets, but in the second row where they, there was a buffer between them and any possible breach of their security. And then not only to have the gorgeous looking, isn't he gorgeous, Johnny Thompson, behind them. But they also had Lord Parker of Minsmere. Now, Andrew Parker is the present Lord Chamberlain. He took over from Lord Peel, who, ironically enough, moved into my flat in the Cundy Street flats when I moved out of it. He's married to Charlotte Soames, that was then. She was Charlotte Hambro. And she accompanied, if I remember correctly, uh, Andrew Parker Bowles to the independence celebrations in Zimbabwe. And she and he were very close friends. She is Sir Winston Churchill's granddaughter. Her mother was his daughter, Mary. And Lord Peel retired, I think it was last year. And Lord Parker has taken over. He is a former Director General of MI5. Now, Harry and Meghan really shouldn't be complaining about their placement in the cathedral because they were seated very protectively to ensure that they could not complain about a lack of security or exposure to danger. I think people should cogitate upon that question because it is an important question to cogitate upon, <laughs> says I naughtily. Lizzie Lucas says, I should have loved to have been a fly on the wall of the Montichet Show mansion tonight when the news broke that Charles has given Windsor Castle to William and they can move in this summer. And not only that, but also the disgraced Andrew being given Balmoral. Imagine the wrath in that house today. The flames and fury will be rising from their snake pit to be seen all over the states. I don't know about seen, Lizzie Lucas, but certainly felt. Except you've got things uh, slightly wrong, if I may say so. It's not in Charles's gift to give them Windsor Castle. It's in the Queen's gift. They are evidently moving into a property at Windsor. But ultimately, because Prince Charles evidently, so the rumours go, has no real interest in spending as much time at Windsor Castle as the Queen has spent. So there is a vacancy there, so to speak. And 
William and Catherine, Charles evidently is going to allow them to reside there down the line, evidently while he is still king. Of course, these things are open to change and it's only speculation at this point. But Andrew has no ambition <laughs> to take over Balmoral. It is hoped that he will retire up to Scotland, <laughs> but I think that's a hope that's not going to meet very much expectation, <laughs> let me put it that way. And also, Harry and Meghan aren't interested in Balmoral. I mean, you notice Meghan has never been to Balmoral. She was asked to go, but it was too great a distance for Archie to travel. So they then traveled a greater distance to the south of France to stay with Elton John and David Furnish. Ah, you know, they're so consistent, aren't they, in their inconsistency. They're so integrated in their lack of integration. They are so perpetually contradictory. Then they wonder why people have seen through them and see that they are the empty vessels that are making too much noise. A. M. Bren says, Dearest Lady C and all, just a thought regarding the comment read out in the video concerning Johnny Depp versus has. Johnny Depp has said and still says in public to his fans, thank you, you are my employers. As in, despite what anyone might feel re the trial outcome, the man shows recognition and gratitude towards those who pay to go see his films. Would Duke has be of that mindset vis-a-vis -vis the British people? One wonders and highly doubts. The irony is, Harry used to court public approbation. He was very popular because he actually understood that people would give him if he earned their regard. Until Meghan came along, puffed up with her self-importance and her nonsense about, well, you're entitled, H, you're entitled. I mean, your father's the King of England. Not quite yet, of course, but. <laughs> so he already had a propensity to self-importance, but she has blown the lid off his skull in more ways than one. And the fact of the matter is, Anybody who is in a position of privilege and who has a public face and who interacts with the public needs to be humble enough to recognize that great fortune is something to be appreciated, not to be puffed up about. I used to say to my children when they were growing up, and you know, children try various shoes on for size as they walk through the journey of life. And all children being brought up in a certain amount of grandeur are going to an extent let it go to their heads. Everybody will be tempted to, but hopefully it's nipped in the bud 
while they're young enough that they don't become arrogant and delusional. And I used to point out to them, just because you're luckier than most people doesn't mean you're better than anyone. You're not better than them. You're just luckier. Count your blessings. This is something an awful lot of privileged people don't do. And this is also something that the Megans of this world don't do. And they actually think that when they join the club, that arrogance is going to announce to the world that they are superior beings. But it doesn't announce that. It announces that you are delusional, that you are abusing the privileges of life, and therefore that you are inferior and undeserving of your good fortune. There is a reason why the word noble has a dual meaning. It doesn't only refer to rank, it refers to a spiritual condition. The word is interchangeable. Nobility is interchangeable as well. Because to be truly noble means that you are truly appreciative of your blessings. I just leave that little thought for Harry and Meghan to cogitate upon, not that they ever will. Jim Weaver says, Dear Lady C and furry friends, I love your wit and comments. Thank you very much. I just saw a beautiful news clip of Prince William opening a Royal Navy Submariner's Memorial. The way he took the time to visit with so many people attending the event was priceless. Maybe Prince Harry could take a lesson from this. This is the way a true royal works and treats the public. Did you see this, Lady C? If so, what are your thoughts? Thank you. No, I didn't see it, but I've seen Prince William in operation. I've also seen Prince Harry in operation. Harry used to be even better at glad-handing and working a room than William was. But William has embraced his destiny. William understands that to be born a prince is a position of tremendous privilege. And he has embraced it. And that is a humbling experience. Monetizing it is an exploitative and therefore an inappropriate response. I tell you who's an excellent glad hander, even though I don't particularly like her, Princess Michael of Kent. When you see her working a room, she is brilliant. She is absolutely so charming. She's fun, she's witty, she's entertaining. She's slightly OTT in a very positive way. It's called singing for your supper. You're supposed to sing for your supper. Work is the price we pay in life for eating. We need to eat. We therefore need to work. I used to say to my children, I actually said it to my younger son the other day, because he's doing something that he really loves. And I said, well, now you really understand, hopefully, what I've said all along. Find work that you enjoy doing and it becomes a pleasure. 
because I used to warn my children, don't be like your grandmother who dedicated her life to pleasure. People who dedicate their life to pleasure, people who want constant attention, the way my mother did and the way Harry and Meghan do, they are, in my opinion, abusing the purpose of life. Life becomes very hard work when your values are wrong. When they're right, no matter how hard the task is, there is fulfillment at the end of the day. You know, being aware of your privileges, being aware of how important you are, is desirable as long as you're also aware of how unimportant you are. I'm reading a book that Hugo Vickers and the Duke of Kent have written about his life as a royal. And he makes the point that his mother, Princess Marina, who was Princess Marina of Greece and Denmark before she became the Duchess of Kent, she pointed out to her children, you are really lucky to be privileged and born princes and a princess and you need to earn that luck and to be worthy of that privilege and that really is it in a nutshell Megan Denny Grates at the very moment that she overrates the importance of royalty. If she didn't demigrate it, she wouldn't have gone on Oprah and said the things she did. She wouldn't have sought to undermine the institution. She wouldn't have sought to puff herself up at its expense. She would have understood that she was very fortunate to be in a position of great privilege that would be a great platform for her to do good. In life, you need, in my view, to understand one of the keys to a truly successful, enriching, fulfilling life. And I'm not speaking about money now. Although it's nice to have money and it's nice to be a worldly success. But that's not really the ultimate. The ultimate is to be on your deathbed and look back and say, I lived my life well. Instead of, I knew the price of everything and the value of nothing. Duality irony the one thing in the new testament that is incontrovertibly the words of christ is the beatitudes at the heart of the beatitudes is irony the irony of life is no matter how important you are, you are still unimportant. And no matter how unimportant you are, you are still important. It is a pity that neither Harry nor Meghan has so far understood that their importance should be a humbling experience and not the platform for endless hypocritical lectures enhanced by the slickest PR machine since Adolf Hitler and Josef Goebbels. 
Karen Shields says, Dear Lady C, speaking of the hawkers getting others to do their dirty work, have you seen P. Dina's train travel when she met Dan Wooten's producer, Ben? While discussing Megan with him, they had a sugar butt in and give her two cents worth. Pitiful, especially since she was trying to discuss racism with P. Dina. I have to say they both handled themselves far better than I would have. And I'm so white, I can't even tell you if I tried. <laughs> yes, I have seen it. It was brought to my attention. I actually dropped Patricia and her cameraman, who I call J.R. Ewing. His name is J.D. At Goring by Sea train station. And Ben, Dan's producer, who I had been speaking to for the last few weeks, came up to me and said, Oh, Lady C, I'm Ben. <laughs> so they, it was total coincidence. And uh, they got on the train. She evidently was interviewing Dan, who I have to say I was really impressed by. I mean, in that interview, he's young, but he didn't lose his cool. I'd have actually chopped her head off with, with my teeth. She was so tiresome, that woman. I mean, so full of nonsense, so idiotic, so one false premise after another. But maybe she'll be happy that she's muscled in for her 15 minutes of fame. And it was literally about 15 minutes long. But it was very useful because it showed the extent to which Meghan and Harry's lies, especially Meghan's, have seeped into the consciousness of those who don't really have enough discernment to understand that they have been duped and that they have been sold a pack of lies. It's troublemaking. That's what Meghan and Harry, and Meghan especially, have done. Troublemaking. I would recommend to everybody that who is listening to this that you look at it if you have the 15 minutes to spare. It addresses the issues of the misinformation that Megan has put out there and how unfair she was, not only to the royal family and the British people, but to the British press. Because, yeah, I mean, everybody should know by now, who knows me, that although I'm very much in favour of freedom of the press, I have had a terrible experience with the press for nearly five decades now. The British press, I should say, only the British press. Notwithstanding that, I have to say, they embraced Meghan. Meghan's nonsense about the British press and the British people being against her and being racist is such a lie. And what was really interesting was that this, this idiotic woman was trying to justify Megan's lies to Patricia, who is a woman of color. And Patricia made the very valid point that she looks mixed race, that Megan doesn't. Megan has gone to great expense and difficulty to erase 
every bit of her African antecedents. Patricia looks obviously part African. And Patricia therefore knows far more about racism than Megan will ever know because Megan might have got it out of a book. She might have, on the one occasion that she had her overheard somebody use the N-word to her mother, I mean, you know, once, I mean, if I had a pound for every time people were nasty to me and about me when I was younger, I would be a very rich woman today. It's no excuse. She can't hide behind one idle comment from one idiotic person. I'm speaking about Megan now. To justify stoking race hatred. But she did. But she did. That, in my opinion, is truly malevolent. Truly malevolent. Pam Boak says, another YouTuber stated that Harry and Meghan were always meant to have their own car for the church service and that we shouldn't believe that they were meant to be on the bus. I guess I just have to use my common sense. If they entered in the correct order, why did Beatrice and Eugenie need to move so that they could get to their seats? Decision made in your favour. Thank you, my dear. You are but one of many people, Pam Volk, who address this issue. And I'm not going to name the creature who made the stupid comment, because he's working for a living. And he might well have been provided with misinformation. You know, he is in a position in life where he is reliant upon information either from palace sources, ser servants, or other reporters. Fortunately, I don't need to sully myself with any of that. First of all, one should never rely on the palace party line. I never have, and I don't think that to start now. And when I say palace party line, I mean the press office's line, because the press office is there to protect, and that is their job, and they should be doing it. And if they wish to ignore inconvenient facts or paper over awkward situations or redivert the conversation in another less injurious way because things are getting awkward, that's their job and they do it. I'm very fortunate. I have never needed to rely upon the press office. God forbid I should rely upon a royal correspondent. I mean, there are one or two of them that I do respect. But most of them, I mean, spare me. <laughs> I mean, oh God. The idea that I would defile myself, that I even exchanging a greeting with them is beyond belief. Well, I would not have been as contemptuous of them as I now am had they not lied and set about trying to damage me over the last 30 years ever since my book, Down in Private, was published. The reality is, they know that they will never have 
access to the world I'm a part of. They will never have access to the sources I do because we function on totally different planets. I don't need <laughs> to bribe servants <laughs> to help things. Oh, God forbid. I certainly wouldn't be dumb enough to be getting in touch with the press office for anything unless it is an absolute denial. In fact, in my 30 years, my contact with the press office has been very limited. I have phoned them up to, as the Jamaicans would say, trace them off. Uh, when they were sending journalists and TV people to me in the 90s, uh, and I phoned up Jeff Crawford and gave him a piece of my mind and told him he was uh, uh, to stop it because they were, they were uh, trespassing upon my impartiality and my reputation for impartiality. And in fact, I've only ever twice contacted the press office for a comment. Once over the surrogacy issue, and the other over the Royal Family Channel, because on both occasions, I needed them to give me a comment. Over the surrogacy business, I suspect I know at least as much as they do. Over the Royal Family Channel, I didn't know and I wasn't going to waste my time to find out. They're there. They're being paid. I phoned and I got put through and got the answer. Valid use of them. but. To ring them up for guidance as to what's going on behind the scenes, which is what most royal correspondents have to do. <laughs> it's farcical. But then that's why they've never been able to write a book. And I've written two groundbreaking books. Diana in private, which they'd like to pretend that Andrew Morton revealed all that I revealed, but Andrew Morton didn't reveal it, I revealed it. And Meghan and Harry, the real story, I was first out of the gate. Everybody else has followed. And I'm going to use a little example and tell you something to show you, to illustrate. When Diana in Private was preparing to be published. Eve Pollard, who was the editress of the Sunday Express newspaper, bought the serial rights for more money than had ever been paid for the serial rights for a royal book up to that time. And they were all fired up with excitement about it, blah, de, blah, de, blah. And if, about a week before they were, we were due to start the serialization, Richard Aylard, who was the Prince of Wales's private secretary, went into Nick Lloyd, who was the editor of the Daily Express and Eve Pollard's husband. And now this I heard from one of the senior members of staff of one of the editors, I should say, of the Express. I'm not going to say who. Richard A. Lord goes in and says to Nick Lloyd, oh, you know, Words to this effect, your wife's making a huge mistake. 
Lady Colin Campbell's book is rubbish. There are no problems in the Wales' marriage. <laughs> this was January 1992. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't make it up. It's so ridiculous. And Nick Lloyd went home and told his wife, and she pulled the plug on the serialization and then started to brief against me and against the book. Well, it was duly bought by Kelvin Mackenzie of the Sun, who had enough nows to know that it was accurate. And I, my, I sued through my publishers and the case trundled on for years. It ended up costing Eve Pollard her position as editress of the Sunday Express. And it cost Express newspapers a vast amount of money because they had to pay us damages. They were dumb enough to believe Richard A. Lord. I mean, what planet were they on? I had named every single person I had spoken to in the acknowledgement section. It was a veritable roll call of the British establishment. And they then actually got in touch with some of the people and said words to the effect, oh, this is blah, blah, blah. Uh, we are in a lawsuit against Lady Colin Campbell and we need to know that you didn't say <laughs> such and such. I mean, talk about cack-handed idiocy. Anyway, that's the category of person that court correspondents have to deal with, you know. Now, I'm not saying Richard A. Lord shouldn't have protected the Prince and Princess of Wales. I am saying that that overblown sow Eve Pollard, who looks as if she sat on a bicycle pump and it inflated her, so that her every aspect is overblown to the grossest extent, should have known better. And so should her husband, Nick Lloyd. Well, so much for success. She was made to leave. Kitty says, dear Lady C, what do you think about the piece in the Telegraph read Prince Andrew demanding that his public role and even some military roles and also for his daughters to become working royals? I think Beatrice would be okay, but Eugenie, a bit doubtful about her, now lives in Portugal. How true is this? Is this Prince Andrew's wishful thinking leaked to the press to force the British royal family's hand and allow him back, or yet again, to anger the public and rally it up against the British royal family. I have noted increasing his pieces against Prince William recently. Is this one and the same? That is, rallying people against the British royal family. Well, Kitty, the Daily Telegraph and the Sunday Telegraph don't do hit pieces against the British royal family. It's one of the few publications that you can actually be sure has a reasonably pure agenda. Having said that, the whole Andrew business is very complex and difficult. Now, yesterday, he took part in some aspects of the garter ceremony, but he wasn't allowed to walk in the procession, which I thought was very sensible. Now, I can see both sides of the question and both points of view. 
Angel needs to make his move while the queen is alive. If he doesn't make his move with the assistance of his mother, he is going to be forever cast out into the Siberian wasteland because neither William nor Charles really wants him back in the royal fold in any way, shape or form. They regard it as protecting the monarchy and I get their point. I do. I get his point of view too. You know, Prince Charles is protecting the monarchy, but when Prince Charles was being lent upon to give up Camilla, he refused to do so because he felt his life wouldn't be worth living without Camilla. He needs to have some compassion for his brother because he only had to give up a woman. Angel is supposed to give up absolutely everything. He's not allowed to work. He's not allowed to have the respect that is due to his rank and position. Think about it. I get his point of view. If Charles refused because he felt Camilla was so important, Andrew has a point of view. He wants to work. He wants to fulfill his purpose the purpose for which he was trained from birth, which is to be a working member of the royal family. I get both points of view. I do think, and I'm going to say this knowing that <laughs> Prince Charles, if he hears about it, is not going to be best pleased, but you know, in life, you can't, you can't just monitor things when it's important to take a position. And one of the former private secretaries said, here, sitting on this sofa just there a few weeks ago, that the royal family had handled the whole Prince Andrew business badly from the word go. They knew he was innocent. They should have backed him up from the word go instead of not backing him up and instead of cutting him adrift. I get that point of view too. Uh, I understand why William and Charles are intent on protecting the monarchy. And I actually think that Andrew should make the sacrifice personally, but it's easy for me to talk because I'm not making the sacrifice. And it's easy for Charles to talk because he's not making the sacrifice. And when he was called upon to make a lesser sacrifice, he didn't make it. And William, he has not made any sacrifice along these lines. Yes, he has made other sacrifices. He has sacrificed his freedom, his independence, his laziness, such as it is. He has knuckled down. So everybody in life has to make sacrifices. But neither William nor Charles has made a sacrifice, the like of which Andrew has been forced to make. And he has been forced to make it, notwithstanding the fact that his accuser is a self-confessed prostitute, 
paid $15,000, according to her. Procurus. Remember the evidence in the Gillen Maxwell trial by the Adriano girl, Procurus. And now she is being sued in the New York courts, if I'm not mistaken, but certainly in the American courts. I think it's the New York courts by somebody she procured. Yet this tainted creature is somehow cleaned up because she is accusing a prince who has categorically denied it. I'm sorry, I rarely just, maybe because I'm not a snob, I just don't get why, if you're very grand, you should be allowed to get away with murder. And if you're very humble, you should be also able to get away with accusing somebody who's grand of any r rubbish, and that you should be believed over them. That's not the way life should work. So, to wrap up, I think Andrew should do and go down the route of John Profumo after but John Profumo in fairness to Andrew was guilty of something he lied to Parliament so he had recompense to make Andrew has no recompense to make because he claims he didn't do it and the truth is even if he did it it was perfectly legal and he to look at it in a completely different way, was still a relatively young man and very good looking at the time and one of the world's most eligible bachelors when he was divorced, but he was still a bachelor. And if she pretended, and her version is that she went along with it, and he didn't know, according to her, that she was reluctant. Well, why would any hot, good-looking guy who's regarded as one of the most desirable men on earth, why would he for one second consider that a new bal young thing who is eager to please didn't like him for himself. If she doesn't say it, how's he going to know? That's another aspect to continue, consider. Nevertheless, I think the monarchy would be best served by Angel withdrawing largely from public life, but not totally. I think he should be allowed to do worthy work. I think it should be made clear with the backing of the family that they don't want him to the forefront because he made a bad choice in the friends that he was keeping, but that he was innocent of any wrongdoing and therefore he should be allowed to conduct his life with dignity. I also don't think he should be restored or uh, the colonelcy of the Grenadier Guards. I gather he wants that. I I don't think he should. I think he should kiss goodbye to all of that. 
Oh, he was in the Navy. He was a helicopter pilot in the Navy. So if he wants to do work for the Navy, but it's better that he does it in a working capacity, where a charitable capacity. It's a very difficult situation and I sympathize with all parties concerned and I get each of their point of view. Sometimes in life you need to have a bit of courage and you need to stand up for what you believe is right. And you need to face down the criticism that will come your way. But you need to make it clear what your position is and why you have taken it. And people will then understand. And those who don't, quite frankly, aren't worth bothering about. And on that note, I will say thank you very much for listening. I hope this has been of some interest to you. If it has, please like, share, subscribe, press the notification bell, and please keep the questions coming in. Remember, this cannot be done without you. God bless and goodbye.